Hi, my name is P.G. Gordy, and this is P.G. Gordy's Dialecticals. Today we're going to be talking about America's Sweetheart, Simone Biles. Today, I want to talk to you about a sports story. One of the greatest sports stories of our time. A story of triumph. story of overcoming adversity, becoming the best in your sport, of changing the very nature of the sport that you are dominating. But before I do that, let's, let's back up and let's imagine a world in which this sports story could never, ever happen. That's how I'm going to start this all off. Stay tuned. I'm going to flick a button, and I'm going to change a scene. And we're going to begin. Well... 2019, let's make it January 1st, 2019. I'm recording this after that date. I should note. January 1st, 2019. Americans wake up to the realization that all the people who don't look white are gone. Black America has disappeared. There are no black people in America. There are no Mexicans. Well, some. Some of them that have shifted over, I guess you could say. Uh, basically, you know, if you can, if you, if, if, if you don't pass for white, you're not here. It's all white. Everybody looks white. White, 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 white. Like, there are even white people who aren't here because, for various reasons, they didn't look white. Like, it's like that. All the non-white is gone. What kind of world would that be for the whites that are here? For them, like, how would they interpret that day? What kind of emotions would they have on that day? I think there's a lot of SJWs out there that would like to tell you that uh, white America would wake up and uh, do its little white bread, uh, Wonder Bread dance. Donnie and Marie Osma would come out with their big old white teeth and uh, everybody, white, 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 I'm dreaming of a white everything, all that stuff. I think that's what they would imagine. That's further from the truth that you could be. I mean, there may be a couple of idiots uh, that would be like, this is great. Trust me, though. It wouldn't take them long to figure out that they were dead wrong in their assertions in the first place. And suddenly, uh, yeah, they're not going to be very happy for long. And white America would not be happy with non-white America being not here. Because non-white America is America. And white America understands that. Not like idealistically, kumbaya, we all want to heal and get over the whole racisms and slavery things, which are horrible, horrible. I don't want to, you know, I'm not making light of them, but I'm, well, I'm making light of other things, but not that in and of itself. <clears throat> and we have the whole imagination from the SJW that uh, the white people don't fundamentally understand how critical to their lives non-white people are. Not like, you know, like there are little helpers. They are our bosses. Sometimes we're their bosses. Sometimes they're our bosses. There are head coaches. Sometimes we're their head coaches. There are husbands. Sometimes we're their husbands. 
there are wives. Sometimes we're their wives. There are there are nephews and our nieces, there are cousins, there are our favorite football player, there are our favorite politician. There's too many white people that like too many people that aren't white. And uh some of them like like the people that they like that are non white are the best people on the planet to them, like, you know, husbands and wives. Nobody could convince me that my wife is not the greatest human being on the face of the planet. She most assuredly is. And I know plenty of black women that feel that way about their white husbands. I know a couple. I know some black husbands that feel that way about their white wives. Imagine them white people waking up without their spouses. Do you know how unhappy I would be? How many people I love would disappear? It wouldn't be about whether they were black or non-white. It would be my friends. It would be my family members. You don't understand how many white people have non-white family members. And, and it worked. that's the other way around as well. White people, fundamentally, because of the reality of power, we have come to depend on our brothers and sisters all around us, our American brothers and sisters. It's not even a question of loving our American brothers and sisters. It's a question of fundamentally needing them. Like, the trains don't run on time if black America disappears, and we all know that. We need black America. Without black America, what the hell is America without black America? Man, we lose our color, and I don't mean our skin color. Black America adds so much vitality in terms of our, our cultural dynamic. They're not the only one. Mexican America. German America. Italian America. I don't know if they're... German America, I don't know if so much it exists. Uh, Italian America, maybe more, but all these Americas, they're all America. And we need our Americas. Every single freaking one of our Americas we need. And this fundamentally is what most of us white people have come to biologically understand if it's possible to have a biological understanding. I don't think it is. I'm just saying but a bit hyperbolic, but biologically understand. And yet, and yet, the SJWs will tell you that uh, we would celebrate and we would not. We would be in pain and anguish. We would be at terrible, terrible loss. If you could internalize the people that you love in your life, if you're black right now and you're listening to this, and if you're white right now and you can internalize this, because I know there's very, very, very few of us that don't have people in our lives that we truly, deeply love, that if they disappeared, we would be at war. Who the who the hell did this? We would we would exact a terrible revenge on whoever would dare do such a thing. There would be no celebrations. And anyone who was caught celebrating would be smitten where they stood. It would be devastating to us. Just Terrible, horrible, horrible imagining. And I bet you that's true of black America. Pock America, there is no such thing, but Pock America. There'd be a very few nut jobs. Unfortunately, those nut jobs are the ones that are running the universities. and the, They're the thought leaders of the SJW movement. It's these nut jobs. They would celebrate. They would really celebrate. 
again, just like the nut jobs whites, they wouldn't celebrate for long. They would they would soon come to realize the errors of the ways. Poc America needs white America. And we need a a a a, a powerful, independent, strong white America. A co equal white America. Not a diminished shamed villainized white America that villainized white America is no better for you than it is for white America but there's more to this story because it's not that the SJW hasn't identified a significant problem in America it's that they want to use that problem to justify some some very, very horrible things that will hurt all of America, white, black, and otherwise, everybody else in between. So they identify systemic racism and the, 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 the counter to SJWism is to say, Everything the SJW says is a lie, and they're all wrong. And well, I'm just here to say the SJW is says a lot of well, from my perspective, my beliefs, my understanding of the universe, a lot of very true things that we white Americans have a very, very difficult time confronting. And in part, we have a difficult time confronting because the uh, the context of of discovering that you have something within you that does not align with your ideational self basically makes you whatever whatever that the the the, the worst part of you is that is the totality of you. That's the SJW way, at least. So. Let's talk about, let's talk about Simone Ariana Biles. Simone Ariana Biles. I don't know how to pronounce her na- last name exactly, but uh, hopefully I'm getting that right. And let's uh, just uh, some of the highlights here. This this is a Wikipedia entry that I'm looking at here. She's a she's now a five time world all around champion. It's unheard of. Historic. Two-time world balance beam champion. Uh, I don't know what she did in these worlds. Of, uh, all of the results for the worlds. Member of the gold-winning American teams of 2014, 2015, 2018, 2019. Uh, she is. She is the Wayne Gretzky of gymnastics. The Michael Jordan of gymnastics, whatever. Insert extraordinary game changer, Red Grange. That's an old football reference. Red Grange changed football. Uh, maybe, maybe it's a promise in football. Patrick Mahomes. She could be the Patrick Mahomes. Not he, well, he has a, he's he's got to put in a few more years here, but uh, it's very possible the way that he plays football. Yeah, he sets a pattern that's really gonna change things. And that's what she's done. Here I'm showing, if you're watching the video version of this and not just listening to the podcast, you're seeing Simone Beale stuns with new triple-double on floor. First ever woman to do this in competition. Extraordinary. Setting the bar. The expectation of what a woman can achieve on the floor on all of the various gymnastics things on our gymnastics expert she's uh she's changing the sport this this young lady she's 16 so i mean my daughter is 14 and i know plenty of 14 year olds that probably uh you probably think of as being like kind of little, little kids my 14 year old daughter's pretty smart pretty advanced i'll say mature uh yeah she's a she's a very mature self uh disciplined young lady and based upon everything i see from this young lady i'd say she kind of fits into that kind of category she's 16 but 
I think she's probably a lot more mature than 16. A whole lot more mature than 16. And she has such presence when you see her in the interviews, when you hear her talk, what she's doing. Look at this girl. If you're watching the video, she is just a beautiful young lady. You know, beauty, beauty is a marker that shows whether it's deserved or not. It shows excellence, quality, integrity. It's such a it's such a powerful face, her face. And just you know, to have as the face of America, to be America's sweetheart, she should be. She has everything that you need to be America's sweetheart. She should be the bomb. We all should be talking about her. SJWs, oh my gosh, SJWs. I mean, shine this girl. Put the spotlight on her. She is. Look at this strong woman of color, this young woman of color, showing what great Americans are. How great it is to be an American. How great America is that can produce such a wonder as this. A human being like this, beautiful, intelligent, charismatic young lady with the lady with extraordinary athletic skills and and demonstrates in, in, in her in her competitive drive, in her in integrity, in the way that she uh she puts in the work, the discipline, everything that you'd want the world to think about America. That's what she is. She's just, I don't know, just like I, everywhere I go, everybody's talking about Simone Biles and what she's been doing. It's just incredible. It's extraordinary. Look at this young lady. Just, just, wow. What a, what a great story. But she has a problem. And I think all of you know what that problem is. This beautiful young girl has just one problem. I'm going to get to that. But before I do, uh, I want to talk about patterns. Patterns. When I grew up in the 70s, I grew up with patterns. When I was a, a little kid. I have I was totally I guess you could say as far as my mind was concerned I was completely defenseless. I had uh I didn't even have two arms behind my back. I didn't even have arms or two hands tied behind my back in that fight. I didn't even have hands. I didn't even know what a back was. I didn't even know it was fight. I just took it. Accepted it cuz I I wasn't smart enough to figure out early enough that uh people were playing me. And then I was the product of other people's fantasies. That I was not perceiving the world that was, but I was being told this is the way we want the world to be. And when I was growing up in the 70s, the world that we want the world to be, if I were to see it in the 70s, listen, man. We freed the blacks and uh, let them vote. And we're not going to beat on them and lynch them anymore. So everybody, here's a couple token blacks that are doing like serious adult things. But even when they do serious adult things, we're probably going to clown on them. Like George Jets, George Jefferson was, you know, setting setting the bar. Really, I mean, Wheezy Wheezy Jefferson was by far and away the the more serious person there. She she did far more to advance the black face as a serious American face than George Jefferson did. But in the 70s, I was given images of beauty and uh, ugly and all points in between, and I grew up with the uh, proverbial saying that I used to say. I'd say until I was about, maybe it was when I was about 15 or 16, that late, 15 or 16. My gosh, my daughter at 14 she knows so much more about how the world is seeking to program her than I ever did. 
at 15 or 16, I have a pretty decently high IQ, but I did not grow up around people that uh, were similarly inclined. So my exposure to intellectual endeavors was almost zero until I was 19. And that's another story. But still, the age of 15, 16 is when it started to dawn on me that perhaps when I say she's pretty for a black girl, that maybe, possibly, that's pretty racist. I, I was never racist. Like, I never viewed back black people as being inferior to me. Intellectually. Like, ideationally. If you ask me, I would sincerely believe it. I never really grew up ever buying that black people were inferior to me, although I've had people try to convince me that they were inferior to me. A lot more in the 70s and the 80s, less in the 90s, but still in the 90s. I haven't, I haven't, I have been, I'll say I have not been uh, attempted to be recruited into racist white America in quite a while. Actually, maybe 10 or more years. This the last time I heard a white person say something like, you know, nobody's around. All of a sudden they look and they say, you know, you know, statistics show. Now I see a lot of it on Facebook. Well, not anymore. I don't do Facebook hardly ever. But when I used to, uh, you know, I see a lot of, uh, especially among the anarchists, a lot of statistics show crap. But uh, <laughs> anybody ever tells you that statistics show that someone is subhuman, just spit on them, walk away. Never, ever, ever listen to that. But I grew up with these patterns of black is drug dealer. Black is criminal. This is literally the overwhelming images that I was fed. I hardly ever saw black people in any kind of position of seriousness, of awesomeness. And all the beauties were all white. Throw in a few uh, coffee with cream black girls uh, in the mix now and then. Now, you do have the uh, black exploitation films in which they actually, I mean, I got to say at least one thing about black exploitation films in the 70s the ladies, the black ladies, I would say that uh, the aesthetic was. It was an appreciation of of blackness as an aesthetic, not blackness trying to conform to a white aesthetic, but blackness reflecting its own unique aesthetic. And, of course, blackness. Black is a color. Brown, whatever shades. And so, you know, immediately you have differences there. There are some degrees of differentiation in terms of bone, bone structures that create different aesthetics, uh, aesthetic tendencies i guess you could say pros and cons and of course the the hairstyles uh black people have a very uh well very very unique hairstyle from i think most people i don't i don't i wonder i don't know i've never really thought about that like are there other i don't know if i use the word race i hate that word but uh like whatever the black the overall black aggregate is we we'll call it a race that tends to produce the the, the, the hair that is tightly curled. It's very unique because, you know, white people, most people are the, the straight hair. Uh, but it it creates a, a unique aesthetic, unique aesthetic opportunities. And so I'll say the black exploitation films, at the very least, uh, I would, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not black. I didn't know black. I, well, I, I guess I kind of did know black culture in the 70s because where I grew up, I was... We were, I was probably like 10 blacks for every whites where I, where I grew up in the 70s for the most part. So I guess I was, I was pretty immersed in black culture in, in that sense, in the 70s at least. But I wasn't really aware at that age that it was a, such a thing as black culture. It was just, you know, where you lived. I understood the difference color-wise between black and white, but I didn't fully understand the, uh, the historical context of that at that time. I mean, I've heard people talking about the Coons moving in uh, to uh, a neighborhood, uh, and uh, I was uh, quite uh, alarmed that uh, Coons were moving into the neighborhood. Now, mind you, I had no idea that Coon meant black person. 
I literally thought raccoons were moving into the neighborhood. And, 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 and only years later did I realize what I was hearing from people around me. People, well, fortunately, I'll say I didn't hear it from the people that I loved. I will say I did not hear it from my close family members that I remember. I don't know, but, don't remember, but uh, I heard it from plenty of people. This thing, this coon thing. And never understood just what vile, dehumanizing garbage I was hearing. No idea. No freaking idea. So I built up patterns, though, that, uh, well, I didn't build up the patterns as a little kid growing up. The patterns were built in me. Patterns that uh, they're still being built, although there's new patterns that are being built all the time that have maybe equally damaging effects in the long run. But these patterns that I built up had created in me, even though I fully believed that, that human beings are human beings and that there is no, there is no inherent value difference between someone because they're black or because they're white. The individual themselves should be allowed to rise and fall based upon their own standing, not their collective whatever, for good or ill. This has always been my belief since as long as I remember even the possibility of having such notions. And yet, and yet, I still said, yeah, she's pretty for a black girl. And I realized that she's pretty for a black girl with racist. Even after I realized it was racist, I still, afterwards, I still said it more than a few times. Every time I said it, though, I was like, oh, man, there I go again. I can't do that. That's. It took me a while to, uh, I guess, deliberately unlearn that. It took me a while to deliberately deconstruct the black female face to understand it in its pure aesthetic, if you will, to remove the constructs that were built within me through the years that cut me off from appreciating the aesthetic of the black female face, to put it in a special lesser category than the white female face as far as aesthetic was concerned. And that's what I understood. I mean, I was 16. Now, I didn't, I don't know if I could have verbalized it quite the way I just did, but that was my understanding. And that, I guess you could say in a lot of ways, a lot of things began when I was 16. And uh, yeah, I'm 51 now. When I was 16, it was uh, 1984. By 1984, I no longer heard people talking about coons moving into neighborhoods I would still say oh well, obviously I, I I still got the 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 white supremacist recruitment center still came my way with some degree of regularity uh, in the 80s I but I was starting to see Cliff Huxtable and Cliff Huxtable was not a buffoon he was a serious black man with a serious job while well, he was funny so and in some part, he had to at least be funny. I guess a, a a bit of disarming for for the white folk to get used to a black person in a serious face. You know, while he was funny, you know, he wasn't the buffoon of George Jefferson. I guess he was the nudge towards uh, social acceptance or whatever you want to call it. No, it's not social acceptance. It's something. What it really is, what I've what I've what I've said is, uh, it is it is simply gravitas. Gravitas. Imagining that a face can represent a full complex human with full complex powers. Gravitas. And for white people, especially if you're fifty, maybe forty, maybe even thirty. Hmm. 30, not so much. 40, probably more. 50, definitely. 60, oh yeah. You've spent decades unlearning, undoing 
the the horrible, destructive, evil shit. Pardon my French. I was put in your head. So, there are 20-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 30-year-olds in America. These ain't the old folk. Because the old folk are not getting all nuts about young sports. So this ain't on us. This ain't on us. This ain't the 50-year-olds, the 60-year-olds, the 40-year-olds. This is the 30-year-olds and the 20-year-olds. Where are you, white 20-year-olds, white 30-year-olds? You got issues. We all have issues. And this, to me, shows. We still got issues. Still got That headline that I have for this show, America Sweetheart, Simone Biles, that should be true. She should be America Sweetheart right now with what she's accomplishing. White America is not racist. White America is not desperately trying to hold on to power. White America has a problem as anybody would, surrendering their identity. Even though I'm here to tell you, black America, Mexican America, whatever America you want to say is not white America. White America loves you and does not want to be the face of America anymore. We we don't want to not be the face of America. We want to be one of the faces of America. We don't we don't want a homogenous white society, a homogenous white culture. But we're also none of us are well. I can't speak for a whole white America. But I'm going to say overwhelmingly, not ashamed of white culture either. White culture is good and it's evil. It's all these things that almost all cultures are. Not ashamed of being white. Not not embarrassed. Not embarrassed. You know, the the, the corny whiteness culture that people complain about. You know, the Donnie and Marie Osmond jokes. I love Donnie and Marie Osmond. Well, the 70s versions, I don't know what they're like now, but I grew up with them. I love them. And uh, I embrace that 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 cheese. I love me some white cheese, and I ain't even embarrassed about it. Abba is the Shazams, and I will dance to Abba, and I will sing Dancing Queen, and I will cry when I sing to Dancing Queen every freaking time. And if that's whiteness, I'm happy. I love it. It's super. It was one of the things I like about whiteness. Then, if that's the case, you don't have to be embarrassed to be white. But you should be embarrassed. We should all be embarrassed. We're not racist. We're not evil. This isn't a sign that America is doomed. But it's a sign that white people, we're we're not where you think we are. If your knee-jerk reaction to the uh, knee-jerk reaction to the SJW, who's got their own nutty issues, they're they're a disproportional response to an overbloated problem, which is significantly worse than the people who counter SJWs imagine it is. And here, to me, is the case. Simone Biles should be popping on Twitter. She should be trending. Should be, it should be right up there with Patrick Mahomes right now, what she's doing. She's an extraordinary young woman. Should see commercial. Oh, I don't know. Can she do commercials? Maybe she can't do commercials yet. Uh, but if she could, as soon as she can I don't know what the amateur status, I think amateur, I don't know. But 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 she needs to be making bank as soon as possible. I want to see it. I'll say one thing. I'll say one thing. I know this is this is an international thing, but uh, to America everything's American. So, I'm just going to say like most Americans probably think of Israel Adesanya as being American. <laughs> Black American, African American, whatever. I bet you, I bet you. I just bet you. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's true. Just, but Israel Adesanya is becoming the face of the USC. And he is going to get endorsements and all kinds of sweet, sweet stuff. And, uh, he replaces Conor McGregor, who used to be the face of the UFC. I used to really love Conor. Turns out, Conor's just a common street thug. He's, that's kind of the way I view him now, just a street thug. So I think it's a beautiful thing that Israel Adesanya is becoming the face of the UFC because that's another one of those not often talked about things. Black Americans, black people in general, very rarely, very, very rarely. You, you, have, to be comp you have to be really, really non-threatening to white people to have a corporate face in America. Now, I, I, I'm here to tell you, though, the SJW is wrong. The whites want the changes that are occurring in their own way that they're looking at the world. As years later, I don't say when I see a female face, she's pretty for a black girl or a black woman, whatever the case might be. I just say she's pretty. And I don't think about her being black or white. I think about her being, well, I may think about her being black or white in the sense that there are some types of aesthetic that are uniquely black and some types of aesthetic that are uniquely white uh, just because of the physicality alone. But other than that, that's not, Oh, she's pretty, she's overcome her blackness. Because that's really what that statement is. She's overcome her blackness. Which means that you're looking at blackness as something less than whiteness. I love whiteness. I embrace it. I embrace what I am. I won't say that I'm proud of my whiteness. Because I just am white. And I, I have multiple cultural influences in me. But I'd say whiteness is probably the prevailing cultural influence. So I, I won't say that I'm proud of it. It is what it is. It's it's got its good sides, its bad sides. Most cultures do. Cultural, whatever you want to call them. But uh, but I love blackness too, and Mexicanness, and I love I love I love culture, cultures. Well, different cultural expressions. I love idioms. I love accents. I love variety. I love to see all the different ways in which human beings can express themselves. And and I guess, you know, even the the different physical expressions that we have that we don't even choose. I didn't choose to be white boy Paul. I was born white boy Paul and uh I'm never going to be embarrassed about that. And I'm also never going to be proud of it. I'm going to be indifferent to my whiteness. Yeah. So let me end this by saying America is not racist. Patriotism is not racism. The flag is not racism. America is an aggregate of individuals that uh, I would say the prevailing unifying belief when you get down to it is freedom of a diverse expression of living within a framework of due process of rule of law that's fundamentally what makes us uniquely compared to the rest of the world uniquely this is the power of america and the, the the closer we come to fulfilling that the better it is for every single human being in this land these lands including alaska and hawaii the continental u.s and it's uh it's a little sec what are we call them little Little provinces, I guess. You call them states, but they're really like, they're disconnected, so they're provinces or something. But little empire. That land, the people that live in that land, the greater, uh, the closer we come to, really, to where if someone 
performs in the manner in which this young lady, Simone Biles, performs and comports herself in the manner in which she comports herself and has a story that is so you this it's it's i mean you want to say the american dream is dead but she is the american dream this beautiful girl this extraordinary young lady is the american dream she is america's sweetheart to me right now she's the best we got right now all the people that i can think of she's america's sweetheart right now she should be the top of the marquee she should be the water cooler discussion she should be the thing that uh white americans look at black americans and they hug one another and say isn't this so freaking beautiful this girl what a unifying figure what a beautiful face for america to be represented by and it's crickets and it's not just crickets from the 50 year olds the racist 50 year old white men it's 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 crickets from the twenty year old black woman. It's crickets from the thirty year old white SJW female with her blue hair. You know, if we're gonna do stereotypes, I don't wait. We're not doing stereotypes. You know what? I strike that. I'm gonna leave it in, but I apologize. I don't want to do that. Doesn't really matter whether I have blue hair or not. Actually, my daughter sometimes have blue hair, and she looks cool. So there. But when we see consistently these stories bear fruit that doesn't seem to be based on the color of your skin, then we know we've come a long way. And, and we don't need to screech at people. I did not need screeched at. I did not need, like, if I was on social media and I was 16 and you caught me in a video saying she's she's pretty for a black girl, I would not have deserved to have my life destroyed for that. I was not a racist when I thought it. I was not a racist when I said it. Well, I was, in part. Human beings, we are we're multivalent. We have parts of ourselves that conflict with ourselves. We have parts of ourselves that act in ways that we're not even fully aware. You call them USJWs, call them social cultural constructs, and I just call them because I think social cultural constructs has a whole other, well, I'm not going to get into that. I'll just say that as close as I come to describing what you call social cultural constructs, I call heuristic institution. Heuristics is the manner, in, you know, it's, it's, it's acting without thinking based upon this mystery. Well, somewhat of a mystery that we have within us. We have built in preset assumptions that uh, aren't based on our top of, uh, necessarily are not based on our top of the level awareness, but have to do with parts of ourselves that we don't know how they come to the conclusions that they come to, how they build up the patterns that they come. And I don't even know if they come to conclusions so much as they simply build patterns patterns based upon expectations of what the world tells us the world is and so growing up in america in which black people are being portrayed very very unfavorably for significant periods of your life and if you're surrounded by surrounded by people that continue in my case i was not surrounded by people that continuously reinforces although i was and various times did find myself surrounded by those people but in the main because of my I guess my circumstances, I, like I said, I, I grew up in, in communities and neighborhoods where, you know, the whites were outnumbered 10 to 1 and most of our friends were black because most of the people there were black. And uh, so it was a little different for me. But uh, even at that, I still managed to get all the messages that I needed from TV. TV was the primary source for TV and movies. TV and movies were my primary sources. And then what, what did I see in the books? In the history books, I saw very, very little coverage of what blacks did in America. Even though you can't tell a story about the awesomeness of America, the parts that are awesome without, uh, in some degree, talking about black America. The first American patriot to die for America was a black slave. So, you know, <laughs> there's that little part of our history. And these things are just 
they I mean they I think they're covered more now, but they weren't covered. And so even growing up surrounded by black people, I still managed to build up negative heuristic institutions within me that even at the age of fifty one I'm still overcoming. But you know, I've discovered not recently, but you know, long ago, but still sometime after the age of sixteen, I've discovered I have way more heuristic institutions in me. Besides uh, negative ones that affect black people, I have heuristic institutions that affect white people. I have uh, negatively. I have heuristic institutions that affect fat people negatively and uh, Asians negatively. And I may spend the rest of my life undoing what I've been told to believe was real and that parts of my body internalized and made real by building patterns within me that I often don't even know until I come upon a circumstance in which there the pattern happens that triggers the response that lets me know holy heck that's that thing that thing you know like suddenly realizing why are you saying she's pretty for a black girl look at that girl if you're watching the video she's pretty she is America she she is in ways that maybe she could never understand, in ways that many of you probably will never understand because you're probably not doing much regarding studying history, <laughs> like vast amounts of history across multiple uh, uh, civilizations and times. If you do that, you start to understand just what it means for a civilization to produce a girl like that. It means wonderful things about that civilization. It's just tremendous things that we're able to produce a girl like that. And that we can give her the resources to shine and to hold that American flag up and say, this is American civilization with the jammy jams. And that's what we should be doing right now. And if and when we see that happen, not 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 in a forced way, not in a uh, an SJW beat you, wrap you across the knuckles with a machete kind of way, uh, but in a from from f just a natural reflection of your understanding of the world, America is black, and, and it's white, and it's. Uh, Haitian and it's Guatemalan, it's Chinese and it's Japanese, it's uh, Hungarian, it's German, it's it's the world. America is the world, but it's the part of the world that puts aside, or at least it dreams to put aside. racial partisanship to create a world in which truly a people, a nation, a nation, not a state, a nation, and truly in which a nation is non-racial, not, not rejecting of race. We can, we don't need to reject race. Black people don't need to stop being black. White people don't need to stop being white. Italians don't need to stop speaking Italian. Mexicans don't need to stop speaking Spanish. We should all also, if we're going to speak Mexican or or Italian or whatever, we should probably have some shared language, whatever that is. Right now it's English. I'm okay if it changed. Maybe it would become Hispanic down the road. I, I really wouldn't care. Um, but other than that, what we need is is a shared assumption that we have an expectation that if we do this, we can expect that, a fair uh, level playing field. But one in which uh, maybe we're looking around and we're seeing, you know, maybe, maybe some of the reasons why Simone is not America's sweetheart is because we continue. We continue to, uh, I'm going to say, allow for the perpetuation of generations of human beings that are, for the most part, trapped 
behind enemy lines. And the enemy is the ghetto. No one in the ghetto, not the people themselves, the system, the systemic racism that continues to allow for ghettos to exist. And it's that American ghetto that is at the heart of why Simone Biles is still not America's sweetheart, even though, gosh darn it, she really is. She really is. And uh, a lesson until we end the ghetto. American whites, you will never fully embrace American blacks as truly of the same gravitas as you view yourselves, as we view ourselves. Because we'll continue to produce generation upon generation of people that from the outside you'll just say are just losers, They're just choosing. Look how violent they are. Look how all the crime and the drugs and just look at them. They chose to be losers. No, they didn't. Lyndon Baines Johnson chose to create a systemic racist system. Martin Luther King Jr. called for a total intense over-the-top investment in black America to unshackle it from its dependence on white America. Give black America the chance to decide consensually whether one black America wants to be part of white America. I'm pretty confident that uh, a self-sustaining, self-directed black America with its own banks, its own businesses, what Martin Luther King envisioned, um, in short order, that, that black America would, would fully and completely integrate with white America while holding on to its distinctive cultural uniqueness and we would be the unity in diversity the the central motif of the indian civilization unity and diversity we would we would have all of the benefits of diversity and uh and yet still be able to look at one another and say you are my american brother or my american sister or hey if you don't want to be male or female whatever you're my american whatever just don't force me to call you an American, whatever, because you probably won't then. But. So I'm going to end it there. I'm going to end it by saying Simone Biles, for me, right now, is the story. She is America's sweetheart, and what she's doing is extraordinary. I'm so happy for her. Six years old. Very different world. Just ten years later, ten years ago, I'd start my own journey. Uh, but not, not nearly as an extraordinary journey as what she took. So, hats off to America's sweetheart, Simone Biles, and congratulations on yet another stunning accomplishment.